War is a force that gives us meaning. He says, in the wars between 1900 and 1999, not less than 62 million civilians have perished, nearly 20 more than the 43 million military personnel killed. In the last 100 years, an estimated 105 million people have died because of war, more than in any other time in recorded history. I can't even fathom that number, 105 million. I think it's safe to say that we, as a Unitarian Universalist people of faith, acknowledge the destructive quality of war. We may feel that war is necessary and support action in certain cases, but very few of us, I think, would choose war as the preferred option, as just a matter of course. Our Unitarian Universalist faith calls us not to be a warring people. Our Unitarian Universalist faith calls us to be a peace-attempting people struggling with the specter of violence in our world. I have to admit to you from the start that I am biased in this regard. I recoil from violence. It's my knee-jerk reaction. My gut response is violence is bad in any form. War is bad in any form. Leaders and governments that send armies into battle are wrong. And yet I know that I am wrong in saying that. I know that I'm oversimplifying that with such black and white statements, I'm hiding from the complexity of life, hiding from the reality of safety in this world. I also know that my anti-violence, anti-war stance is also a reaction caused by two things, my own personal experience with violence and my own wrong understanding of some key spiritual teachings, especially those of the Buddha. First, experience. Before we can discuss violence or war, we each must be honest about what creates our gut responses. What is your personal experience with violence? I recoil from violence because I have felt in a very small way the pain that it can cause. One of my earliest memories is from first grade. I remember running down the street towards home, being chased by an older boy who was hitting me on the head with his metal lunchbox. I remember my mom standing in the driveway, crying, but refusing to stop the hitting because it was time for me to learn to stand up for myself. Was she right to stand by and watch me hurt in order to make me more of a man? Did I learn to stand up for myself that afternoon? No, what I learned was that metal lunchboxes hurt my head. Those metal lunchboxes turned into metal lockers as I grew older. I was skinny, and I was what back then they would have called a sissy. Or as my mom would say, you're sensitive. <laughs> sensitive boys are ripe for slamming into lockers for vicious name calling and fists. I was an easy prey for the bigger boys. I guess I was supposed to learn to defend myself and fight back, but I never did. Instead, I learned to be afraid of hallways and the guys who played on the high school football team. And now I am sensitive to anyone, be it a country or a person, that might use power and might to bully others, to use that power to force their views and values on anyone. But the violence that most shaped me was the violence in my home. I know firsthand how a father's fist can hurt a body and crush a spirit. I know how anger can explode into physicality that seems impossible to escape. Thankfully, my family has done our healing and found our way to peace. But I'm still very sensitive to anyone, be it a person or a country, who might use explosions of anger to dominate and control, that might use violence because they don't know how to talk, to reason, to seek alternatives. And so I admit, because of my experience, I recoil from violence. How does your experience inform your response to violence? A war? How could it be different from the person sitting next to you? And how can we learn from each other's experience to go beneath our gut or conditioned responses? 
If our support or condemnation of war comes too easily, or if it's filled with polarized ideology, which is the case for many liberals as well as conservatives, I suggest we may be skimming the surface of our self-awareness. In terms of spirituality, I also recoil from violence. As I looked at the great wisdom traditions, especially the gentle teachers of Buddhism who inform much of my worldview, I heard the path of peace lifted up as the true way. I heard the teaching of ahimsa, or nonviolence, espoused by the great teachers of India, especially most recently Gandhi. I heard the Buddha teach that violence only plants seeds for more violence time after time after time until 105 million people can be killed in just 100 years. But was I looking only at the surface of these teachings? Could my own experience be coloring what I heard and read about the Buddha and peace? Buddhist scholar Andrew Olensky writes, a question that has been coming up a lot lately is this. According to the teaching of the Buddha, is violence ever justified? The short answer, he writes, is no. But in a longer answer that probes more carefully some of the practical dimensions of the human condition, there may be ground for modifying this position. The Buddha understood that we're all living out different roles in the world. We're all walking along different paths. Therefore, what is right for one who has chosen the role and path of, say, a contemplative monk is a different role and a path than one who is, say, an army general, a soldier, a contractor who works with the military, or the leader of a nation. Dr. Paul R. Fleischman writes, the Buddha did not teach social and political philosophy. He taught a path of life, not a blanket ideology. Guiding each interested individual to walk the path, the Buddha encouraged a pure mind that seeks the least harm. But he recognized different roles and obligations, different responsibilities and necessities accumbent on different individuals. Not all people are called or expected in this lifetime to live the life of an enlightened being. For us to expect the soldier or king to act with the same heart-centered compassion as the monk is foolish. Each, the Buddha says, has a different role and is at a different place on their journey in this lifetime. In all the teachings of the Buddha, he never once told any of his pupils who were soldiers to put down their arms. He never once told any of the kings who studied with them to cease their warring or condemn them for going into battle or fulfilling their governmental functions. None of this, though, justifies hatred or violence in service of personal goals or gains. For the government employee who, for example, as a soldier must kill, the Buddha asks this question. Can you do this task as an upholder of safety and justice, focused on the love of those you protect, rather than on hate for those you must kill? A fervent champion of self-awareness and compassion, the Buddha challenged them and us to look into our own hearts. He challenged them and us to ask, what is the motivation for our actions? And then to ask again, am I sure of that? Knowing ourselves and knowing why we do something is his goal. And so, looking back immediately after the terrorist attack of September 11th, 2001, a Buddhist perspective, and I would say a spiritual perspective, had to ask why we were attacking Afghanistan. Was the outrage in the country so overwhelming and galvanizing because 3,000 lives were lost and this was unacceptable? Was it because we could not risk any more death to terrorism? Was it because life was so precious that we could not allow any of our citizens to be at risk? Perhaps that is the case. But a spiritual person must look deeper and ask even bigger and more encompassing questions. A spiritual person must ask, as Dr. Paul R. Fleischman does, how do terrorists compare to other 
forces of destruction. Do the 3,000 deaths at the World Trade Center mean more than the 30,000 people who die in the United States every year by suicide, personal terrorism that gets little attention? How do these deaths compare to the estimate of 300,000 deaths per year in the United States due to secondary preventable complications of obesity? What about the approximately 50,000 who die in violent car accidents annually? What about violence against the environment that might eventually eliminate all human life? We say we need to protect ourselves, and we do need to protect ourselves. So why have we not declared a public war on obesity, suicide, or car accidents, many of which are preventable and have already claimed many more lives than terrorism? Why the energy around terrorism? Is it because it's convenient and popular? And why the inaction in other areas? Is it because it would cause us to be uncomfortable and unpopular? Because it would cause us to talk a lot about mental illness, because it would cause us to talk a lot about addiction, because it would cause us to talk a lot about personal responsibility. If we truly want to protect ourselves and make the world a safer place, why not marshal our energy and resources for the other causes of death as well? The Buddha challenges us to search our hearts for the honest answer before we declare war on anything. Be aware, says the Buddha, knowing the motivation for action and the motivation for not choosing to take action. And what about nonviolence and pacifism? Is there a difference? There's a story told about Buddha as recounted in the Abhayarajaka Mara U Marasutta. Prince Abhaya was holding a young infant in his lap, says this story. The Buddha asked the prince, what do you think, prince? If you looked away from this infant for a moment and this child were to put a stick or pebble in her mouth, what would you do to her? I would take the pebble out, he replied. The Buddha pressed further. What if it was really stuck in her throat? The prince replied, if I could not get it out and the baby was choking, I would take her head in my left hand and crooking a finger of my right hand, I would do what it took to take it out, even if it meant drawing blood. Why is that? asked the Buddha. Because I have compassion for the child. Did the Buddha believe that nonviolence and pacifism are the same things, that they are always both paths to peace? The answer is no. Nonviolence is different from pacifism. Pacifism is the belief that doing harm, that violence, war, and the taking of lives are always unacceptable ways of resolving disputes. It is the refusal to take up arms or participate in war under any circumstance. But could not pacifism sometimes allow a greater wrong to be perpetuated? Is restraint from action, from war, an act of peace or an act of violence if the resulting death from inaction is monumental? The world refused to stop Hitler early in his expansion, even though it was obvious what his ultimate motives were in terms of world domination and slaughter of the Jews. Historians say that if the United States and Europe had acted early when Hitler's troops and territory were small and contained, World War II and that horrific slaughter could have been prevented. Will the same thing be said about us and the civil war in Syria? The Buddha did not teach war, but he did not teach pacifism either. He taught nonviolence, creating the least possible harm in a situation. Sometimes pacifism becomes great violence. Even Gandhi suggested that there were times when and where not killing might actually be a form of implicit violence. Paul R. Fleischman writes, did you imagine the Buddha as a yielder, as someone toadying to the unrepentant murderer? Did you imagine the Buddha building alliance with the tyrants to keep the current calm claiming unprincipled enabling as peacekeeping. He did not prescribe that humankind lie down before the demonic, the jihads, and the crusades. He taught a lifetime path to shape 
a new humanity, starting with oneself and spread by inspirational example. From this perspective, it's clear that the Buddha imagined a world that would eventually become so self-aware and so aware of the preciousness of life that no person would think to harm another. But the Buddha was not naive. He knew that that day was far away, perhaps even just a dream. But dream we must, and walk towards that day we must. And as we walk together, we have three tasks ahead of us. First, we must ask, how does our own experience, our own agenda, color our opinion as we move forward towards peace or war? This is the first spiritual task. If our answer dances close to the simple war is bad or patriotism is right, then I would challenge us to go deeper. Otherwise, we are remaining on the surface and not in the depths asked to us by spirituality. The second question we must ask, what are our motives? Are they as clear and direct as we say they are? And the third question, knowing all this, we must ask, how then shall we act? How then shall we act? Blessed be. Amen.